The Tripartite Tractate. This is a Gnostic text that was almost completely eliminated and wiped off the face of the planet. There are fortunately plenty of books now that if you want to even go purchase them on Amazon, you can pick up a copy of the Nag Hammadi Scriptures. I'd recommend picking up the most recent updated version. It's edited by Marvin Meyer. And this is so powerful. You read the description of divine source and the way that it's encapsulated and symbolized. It's incredible. It reminds me so much of the way that I think about certain things. Not completely, but a lot of what it talks about, I feel and resonate strongly with. And I'm going to share it with you guys. There's a reason this information was virtually destroyed. There's a reason the Vatican and many religious zealots and institutions wanted this information destroyed, especially almost 2,000 years ago. Now, this is a specific system. It's called a Valentinian theology, and though it's not well known, it's fascinating and incredible to research when you get to the, the blueprints of the understanding and interpretation of source and the demigods, fallen angels, the battle between good and evil, right, wrong, and how to really understand things in a symbolic level if you have to, you know, the best way to, to wrap your mind around, wrap your mind around what some of the possibilities of source can be, I would definitely recommend kicking back, relaxing, and listening to this now. So, the importance of this tractate is above all that it contains a version of the Valentinian system, and it was distinctly Valentinian at the same time that it differs on many points from the well-known systems reported by the Church Fathers. For this reason, it helps us understand better what are the constant and indispensable features of the Valentinian systems, what are individual and local variations, Thus, the system of tripartite tractate does not have a pleroma of 30 eons and does not list the names of the eons. Its eons are numberless and nameless. Instead of presenting the pleroma as being unfolded by means of arithmetical and geometrical, the tripartite tractate describes the emanation process in embryological, embryological terms, say that three times, and then backwards and do it forwards again, nanny, nanny, terms as a gradual formation of the pleroma within the father that ends in the birth of the eons as autonomous beings. Further, there are not two Sophias, as in other systems reported. The fallen eon is not called Sophia at all, but simply a logos, or word. Break this down real quick for you before I read it. The first principles, the Father, the Son, the Church of Eons, the projection of the eons, the passion of the youngest eon, and the origin of the material powers, the conversion of of the Eon Logos and the origin of the physical powers, the mission of the Savior and the origin of the spiritual kind, the creation of the cosmos and the region of the middle, the creation of humanity and the expulsion from paradise, the errors of humankind and the prophecies, the advent and work of the Savior, the destiny of the three kinds of humans. Okay. Part 1. Introduction. In order to be able to speak about exalted things, it is necessary that we begin with the Father, who is the root of the all, and from whom we have obtained grace to speak about him. For he existed before anything else had come into being except him alone. The Father. The Father is a singular while being many, for he is first and he is unique. 
though without being solitary, how else could he be a father? For from the word father, it follows that there is a son, that singular one, who is the only father, is in fact like a tree that has a trunk, branches, and fruit. Of him, it may be said that he is a true father, incomparable and immutable, because he is truly singular and God. For no one is God for him, and no one is father to him. He has not been born, and no other has brought him into being. For whoever is the father of somebody, or his maker himself, has a father and a maker in turn, it is certainly possible that he may become the father and the maker of whoever comes into being from him and is made by him. Still, he is not a father in the true sense or a god in so far as someone has given birth to him and has brought him into being the only father and god in the true sense, therefore, is the one who has been born by no one, but who, on the contrary, has given birth to the all and has brought it into being. He is without beginning and without end, for not only is he without end, being unborn makes him immortal as well, but he is also unchangeable in his eternal being, in that which he is, in that which makes him immutable, and that which makes him great. He does not move himself away from what he is, nor can anyone else force him against his will to cease being what he is, for no one has made him what he is. Therefore, neither does he change himself, nor will another be able to move him from that in which he is, from what he is, from his way of being, or from his greatness. Thus, he cannot be moved, nor is it possible for another to change him into a different form, either by reducing him or changing him or making him less. For this is truly and veritably how he is unchangeable and immutable, being clothed in immutability, thus he is called without being and without end, not only because he is unborn and immortal, but also because just as he is without beginning, he is without end in his manner of being, he is incomprehensible in his greatness inscrutable in his wisdom invincible in his might and unfathomable in his sweetness in the true sense he alone the good unborn and perfect father who lacks nothing is complete filled with everything he possesses excellent and precious qualities of every kind moreover he has no envy, which means that all he owns he gives away without being affected and suffering no loss by his gifts, for he is rich from the things he gives away and finds rest in what he graciously bestows. Therefore, his manner, his form, and his greatness are such that nothing else exists besides him from the beginning, neither a place in which he dwells from which he has gone forth, or to which he will return, nor an original form that he used as a model for his work, nor fatigue that came over him as a result of what he did, nor matter that lay before him and from which he made the things that he made, nor a substance inside him, and from which he brought forth the things created to speak in such a way is ignorant rather he himself being good lacking nothing perfect and complete is everything there is no name that suits him among those that may be conceived spoken seen or grasped however brilliant exalted or glorious it is to be sure possible 
to speak such names in order to glorify and praise him to the extent of the capacity of whoever wants to give glory. But the way he is in himself, his own manner of being, that no mind can conceive, no word express, no eye see, and no body touch, so incomprehensible is his greatness, so unfathomable, his depth, so immeasurable, his exaltedness, and so boundless, his extension. Such is the nature of the unborn one. He does not get to work starting from something other than himself, nor does he have a partner. This would imply a limitation, but he has such an existence that he has neither figure nor form that can be perceived by the senses. This means that he is incomprehensible as well. And if he is incomprehensible, it follows that he is unknowable. Being inconceivable for any thought, invisible for anything, unutterable for any word, and untouchable for any hand. Only he himself knows himself the way he is, with his form and his greatness and his magnitude, and only he is able to conceive himself, name himself, and grasp himself, for he, the inconceivable, ineffable, incomprehensible, and unchangeable one is mind for himself, eye for himself, mouth for himself, and form for himself. And it is also himself that he conceives, sees, speaks, and grasps. That which he conceives, sees, and speaks is nourishment and delight, truth, joy, and rest and that which he thinks surpasses every wisdom, excels every mind, excels every glory, excels every beauty, and every sweetness, every greatness, every depth, and every exaltedness. Now, although he is unknowable in his nature and possesses all those supreme qualities I have described, he is nevertheless able, if he so desires, to grant knowledge in order that he may be known. Out of his abundant sweetness, he possesses power, which is his will. For the moment, however, he holds himself back in silence. He, who is the greatest being, the cause of the generation of the members of the all into external existence. For it is truly his ineffable self that he engenders it is self-generation where he conceives of himself and knows himself as he is he brings forth something worthy of the admiration glory praise and honor that belong to himself through his boundless greatness his inscrutable wisdom his immeasurable power and his sweetness that is beyond tasting it is he himself whom he puts forth in this manner of generation and who receives glory and praise, admiration and love, and it is also he who gives himself glory, admiration, praise, and love. This he has his son dwelling in him, keeping silent about him, and this is the ineffable within the ineffable, the invisible, the ungrasped, the inconceivable within the inconceivable. This is how he exists eternally within himself. As we have explained by knowing himself in himself, the Father bore him without generation so that he exists by the Father having him as a thought that is his thought about himself, his sensation of himself and of his eternal being. This is what in truth is meant by silence or wisdom or grace, as the latter is so rightfully called, just as the Father truly is one before whom no other existed and after whom there is no other unborn one. In the same way, the Son as well as truly one before whom no other Son existed and after whom there is no other. For that reason, he is a firstborn 
and only son, firstborn because there was no one before him, and the only son because there was no one after him. The pre-existent church. Moreover, he has his fruit, though it remained unknown, because of his overwhelming greatness, and he wished to make it known, because of his abundant sweetness, he revealed his inscrutable power, and he mixed it with the plentiful abundance of his generosity, for not only the Son, but also the church, exists from the beginning. If somebody now thinks that this statement is contradicted by the fact that the Son is an only Son, that is not so, because of the mystery of the matter, for just as the Father is singular and was shown to be his own Father, so also the Son may be found to be his own brother without generation and without beginning. It is himself the Father admires as Father and to whom he gives glory, praise, and love, and is equally himself that he conceives of a Son in accordance with the qualities without beginning and without end. This is how the matter is being firmly established his offspring the ones who are are without number and limit and at the same time indivisible they have issued from him the son and the father in the same way as kisses when two people abundantly embrace one another in a good and in satiable thought it is a single embrace, but consists of many kisses. This is the church that consists of many people and exists before the eons and is justly called the eons of the eons. This is the nature of those holy, imperishable spirits upon which the Son rests, since it is his essence just as the Father's rest in upon the Son. The church exists in the properties and qualities in which the Father and the Son exist, and which I have described earlier. Thus it consists of innumerable births and eons, and these in turn give birth in infinite number through the qualities and properties in which they exist. These are a community formed with one another and with the ones who have gone forth from them, and with the Son because of whom they exist as glory. For this reason no mind can conceive of them. Such is the perfection of that place, nor can words speak of them, for they are ineffable, unnameable, and inconceivable. Only they are able to name themselves in order to conceive of themselves, for they are not rooted here below. Those who belong to that place are ineffable, are innumerable in accordance with the special structure that this is, and this is the form and the manner, and this is the kind, the joy, and the delight of the nameless, unnameable, inconceivable, invisible, and ungraspable, unborn one. It is the fullness of of his fatherhood whereby his abundance becomes procreation the all before it was brought forth of the eons existed eternally in the father's thought and he was like a thought and a place for them and once it was decided that they should be born he who possesses all power desire to take and bring what was incomplete out of those who were within him but he is as he is for he is a spring that is not diminished by the water flowing from it as long as they remained in the father's thought that is, while they were in the hidden depth, the depth himself certainly knew them, but they on their part were incapable of knowing the depth in which they found themselves, nor could they know themselves or anything else. In other words, they existed with the Father, but did not exist for themselves. Rather, the kind of existence 
they had was like that of a seed, or it may be compared with that of an embryo. He had made them in the manner of the word which exists in a seminal state before the things it will bring forth have yet come into being. The Father's Plan For that reason the Father had also thought in advance that they should exist not only for himself but should exist for themselves as well. That they should remain in his thought as mental substance but also exist for themselves he sowed a thought as a seed of in order that they might understand what kind of father they have. He showed grace and provided the first form that they might perceive whom they have for a father. The name of the father he granted them by means of a voice calling out to them that he who is is by that name and possessing it one comes into being. How exalted the name was. However, they did not realize for as long as the infant is in the state of an embryo it has what it needs without ever having seen the one who sowed it. For that reason, they had this only as an object to be sought after. They understood that he existed, and they desired to find out who the existing one might be. But the Father is good and perfect, and just as he did not close himself to them so that they should remain forever in his thought, but granted that they should come into being for themselves also. In the same way, he would gracefully allow them to understand who the one who is, is. That is the one who knows himself eternally. Receive form in order to know who the one who is, is. In the same way as when one is brought forth here below, when one is born, one finds oneself in the light and is able to see one's parents. The all is not made perfect from the beginning, for the Father produced the all like a little child, like a drop from a spring, like a blossom from a vine, like a shoot, so that they needed nourishment, growth, and perfection. He withheld the perfection for a time, having kept it in his mind from the beginning, he possesses it from the beginning and looks at it, but he concealed it for those who had come forth from him. This was not out of jealousy, but it was in order that the eons should not receive their perfection from the beginning and thereby exalt themselves in glory as equal to the Father and think that they had achieved this perfection out of themselves. But just as they came into existence because it pleased them, so also it was because it pleased him that he benevolently granted them a perfect thought that would make them faultless. The Father reveals himself in the Son through the hymns of the mind. That which he now made to rise like a light for those who had gone forth from himself that by which they are given a name, that is the Son, the full and faultlessly perfect one, the Father brought him forth while he remained united with the one from whom he had gone forth. Receiving glory together, the all according to the ability of each one to receive him, this is not yet his greatness that they have received, rather he exists only partially in the manner the form and the greatness that he is, for they are able to see him and to speak with regard to what they now know about him, since they carry him and he carries them, and they are able to reach him as well, though he remains the way he is, the inimitable one, in order that the Father may be glorified by each and every one and reveal himself in being hidden and invisible in his ineffability. He is admired in the mind 
For this reason his great exaltedness can be revealed when they speak about him and see him gratefully singing hymns to him about his abundant sweetness. Wow, there, there's more to this. There's, there's quite a bit more, so I'm going to leave it here because I think that that really gives a good reference point to this specific scripture or basis point or mindset of symbology, symbolism. Some people say symbology isn't a word, it is a word, but we'll use sim- symbolism. Metaphors resonating at the conscious and subconscious, spiritual, physical, mental level, all levels. I think that was really powerful. And the interesting thing is a lot of this stuff that I just read to you, much of this I have talked about previously and had that same mindset without reading this specific treatise. So I think that's incredible. And what's your take on this definition of divine source or what you might call God? Not a demigod, but source, the ultimate. And if divine providence, the creator of all, is all-knowing for those that fill divine sources all-knowing and creates free will, creates people to be able to do what they choose, yet if they make a mistake, then the consequences are eternal damnation would that does that make logical sense and after listening to this description of god of divine source does this change your mind about what your interpretation is of source or do you still feel if you are of a specific religion does this have no effect or does this sound evil to you and the reason i ask is because i've read several gnostic texts and it's interesting how people say that the texts are evil or wrong or or wicked or Luciferian, and they will leave comments that show their ignorance. Now, if you offer a strong rebuttal or something with substance or even any evidence that points to why these messages were virtually destroyed, why these scriptures were almost completely eliminated, and people were killed for these things, you guys, These scriptures back in the day, people were killed over these scriptures. Just think about that. People lost their lives because of these. Now, it doesn't mean they're right. certainly makes me wonder why they were suppressed so much and why they were willing to kill over it and make it so important to have just one canon, one specific set of rules. Talk about the New World Order hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago. The New World Order isn't new. (laughs) There's new world orders all the time. Who knows what version we're in now? It's way above 2.0. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash clandestine time lord. Also check out leakproject.com. We have exclusive podcasts for premium members there. 10 bucks a month, 50 bucks a year. It's definitely worth it. Plus your contributions greatly help Leak Project. If you want to just watch the shows for free, most of them are free on youtube.com slash clandestine time lord. Make sure to support our sponsors. Get the tea.com. Feel amazing. They have the best supplements on the market, period. The best colostrum. They've got really good products for your immune health support, skin care, hair care. Also, check out Vivos, TerraVivos.com if you're interested in an off-grid shelter slash concrete bunker slash survival type insurance. These things are amazing in South Dakota, a couple hours away from Sturgis, about an, about half an hour away from the Black Hills. It's in the middle of nowhere, yet close enough to where if you need to get somewhere within less than half an hour, that there's restaurants and stores, gas stations, etc. you can. Also check out the Quick Bivy. I'll leave a link in the video description box. These things are amazing. They fit in the palm of your hand. And if you are taking a road trip, if you have a bug out bag, if you have a camping bag, you should definitely have one of these regardless if you don't or if you do. If you do, put them in your bug out bag, put them in your camping bag, put them in your glove box, put it in your backpack when you go hiking. If you get in a situation where you need to stay warm 
for a longer period of time, these quick bivvies are awesome. I mean, you can wrap yourself up in one of these things and stay warm longer to the point of hopefully if you know, you're know you outside for a day or two days, you need to spend the night outside depending on the conditions, You know, one of these quick bivvies could definitely help extend your life. And they're cheap. And people I know spend thousands of dollars on stuff, you know, for the bug out situations and they miss the little things. So check it out, Quick Bivy. I'll leave the link in the video description box. That is my shameless plug, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for everything, question everything, and be the change you wanna see.